this lesson is on payment materials which will be covered in different parts today we are covering part 1 of payment materials in this part we will be mainly be focusing on subgrade soils the specific objectives of this lecture will be after completing this lesson the student is expected to have learnt about different materials that one can use or one has to deal with for constructing different types of payments. We are going to talk about granular payments, bituminous payment, concrete payments and other types of payments and we will learn about the materials that are going to be used in different types of payments. It is also expected that the student would be able to understand the parameters to be considered for selecting appropriate method for characterizing payment materials. For example, if there are different layers that are used in a payment, what is the parameter that is to be used in for designing, for evaluating, what is the parameter to be considered for subgrade, what is the parameter to be considered for granular material, bituminous material, concrete payment. So, we will be considering what are those parameters that we have to adopt for design purpose and for evaluation purpose. It is also expected that the student will be learning about the different properties of soils. As I said earlier, we will be focusing mostly on subgrade soils. So, we will be talking about various properties of soils that are relevant for payment design and for payment construction. As you have seen earlier, payment has got different components. For example, if you take a flexural payment, it may be on embankment, yet it may be on cutting. So, as a result, you may have embankment, which consists of soils. You may also have subgrade, the top either 300 millimeter or 500 millimeter which is prepared to standard specifications, prepared to attain specified strength is considered to be subgrade. So, we can have embankment, we can have subgrade, we can have different layers of granular materials and we may also have bituminous layer. And the shoulders can be either treated or untreated. Similarly, for a typical concrete payment, also we can have embankment, we can have subgrade, above which you can have sub base, it can uh, uh, at times be considered as base, and over which we place concrete slab. And here again, we can have shoulders which are either treated or untreated. So, in the case of concrete payment, we have concrete slab, granular are treated bases, sub base and also the embankment material and then the shoulders. We use different types of payment materials for different types of payments. Obviously, for bituminous payments we are going to use bituminous materials, concrete payments we are going to use concrete slabs. So, some of the materials that we normally come across in the construction of payments are soil for embankment and for subgrade, aggregates for different sub base and bases and also used in uh, bituminous construction and also for concrete payments. These aggregates can be natural or artificial and then we have bituminous binding materials either bitumen, tar, emulsion or cutback. Among bitumens, we can also have modified bituminous binders, polymer modified, rubber modified and various other modified binders are available nowadays. Then we have bituminous mixes, which is a combination of aggregates, different ty types of aggregate, different sizes of aggregate and bitumen are different types of bituminous binders. We also use cement and we have cement concrete of different types, plain, reinforced, pristress cement concrete. We occasionally used stabilizing materials, especially for sub base and base, even subgrade also can be stabilized. We also use recycled materials. The existing payment materials 
can be recycled and reused with certain modifications. It can be bituminous materials that can be recycled. It can also be concrete pavement that can be recycled. Recycle at the same place. Recycle mill removed and reused at elsewhere. We also have other types of materials used for specific purposes such as geotextiles, geomembranes and other types of materials. It is necessary to study about permanent materials because we need to understand the behavior of the materials individually and in combination with other materials. We normally characterize these materials for the following purposes that is to classify or grade. For example, we have cements of different grades, vitamins of different grades, cutbacks of different grades. Each particular grade is used for a specific purpose. We are also characterize or test or evaluate these materials to obtain necessary inputs for design of new structures. Different design approaches require different inputs. Certain approaches you uh, require elastic modeling or elastic properties of the materials. Other approaches use viscoelastic properties of these materials and others use some simple parameters like index properties, gradation and some other simple strength parameters. We also characterize the materials to obtain inputs which tell us about the condition of the material in existing pavement. The previous point we discussed about the inputs that are required to design new pavements. Whereas, you may already have an existing pavement and we are trying to evaluate that find out its condition and see whether any reinforcement is required, whether any strengthening is required. So, what are the properties of the materials as they exist in field? It is also very important to be able to evaluate that. So, we characterize materials for that purpose also and we have to carry out certain tests to ensure that proper quality is being ensured during construction, after construction. So, we also carry out certain tests for ensuring quality construction and the study of permanent materials is usually done by conducting laboratory tests on representative samples. Representative is a keyword. We should be able to select conditions, testing conditions and the conditions using which we are going to prepare this specimen in such a manner that they are representative of the field conditions, representative of the conditions to which the material is going to be subjected to during its service condition, service life period. And we also get these material properties by conducting field evaluation instead of bringing samples to the laboratory and testing them. Tests are conducted on the materials as they exist in field under field conditions and get the material properties. These are normally useful for evaluating the condition of the payments in service payments. If we cannot do either of these two, that means we are not in a position to conduct laboratory test. We are also not in a position to go to the field and carry out extensive field evaluation test. We can evaluate the or estimate the parameters that are required for design of new payments or for design of overlays or rehabilitation measures by estimating those important parameters from some simple parameters that can be very easily obtained. There are certain parameters that we have to consider before we are able to characterize the materials properly and adequately. These are parameters which are very important for the performance of the payments, which have significant influence on the performance of the materials during its service life period. These are loads. We should know whether the, we are going to deal with stationary loads. It may not be stationary forever, but stationary for sufficiently long period. And are they moving loads? If they are moving loads, what is the speed at which they are going to be moving? Are they very heavy loads, light loads? How is the load applied to the payment? What is the nature of stress distribution? Is it by impact? 
is it by normal stresses are there going to be surface shear stresses we also need to understand the climatic conditions that the material is going to be subjected to for example if you are using bituminous materials if we are using these materials at locations where we are expecting very high temperatures or very low temperatures these temperatures we should be able to understand and define what is the range to which the bituminous materials are going to be subjected to because we know that bituminous materials have different properties at different temperatures similarly we also need to have information on the moisture contents the possibility of some of these materials being under submerged condition or the levels to which levels of moisture content, content that is likely to be there during various seasons of any year and also whether this is a material that is going to be affected by the presence of moisture if yes we have to select appropriate moisture content in the preparation of the specimen and in characterizing the material certain materials are going to be affected by weathering action cyclic wetting and drying process chemical action and cyclic freezing and thawing action freezing and then melting action so if we are dealing with materials that are going to be affected by these phenomena then we have to evaluate those materials either in the laboratory or in field what is going to happen to these materials how the strength and performance of these materials is going to be affected when they are subjected to this weathering action the material properties to be considered should be relevant to the design approach adopted this is very important each design procedure has got a framework and what is the material that has to be used for each material certain parameter or set of parameters are to be defined and those are the parameters that are to be used in design and redesign or overlay design or evaluation just because we have sophisticated equipment available just because new types of testing methods are being made available to us we cannot go on replacing the parameters that were there earlier with new parameters that can be determined by other procedures because the original design procedure has been developed by correlating the performance of the payment with those parameters that have been listed in the framework of payment design you cannot go on introducing new parameters in the system unless we have sufficient data to validate the correlation between the new parameters and the performance of the payment it is very important to keep in mind that we have to as far as possible use only those parameters that are there in the framework of the payment design the property should also reflect the performance of the payment structure we have to be only be talking about if a payment design has to be rational we have to be talking about only those parameters which have some bearing on the performance of the payment so each material has to be evaluated only for those parameters which have some bearing on the performance of the payment during its service life period the material behavior can be characterized fundamentally in terms of the following relationship that we can discuss such as stress strain relationship and the ability of the material to recover after the load is released and the time dependency of the material or the material behavior and similarly the temperature dependency of the behavior of the material for example if you consider this stress strain diagram for a given material it can be represented by a straight line such a behavior is considered as linear behavior in many cases in fact in most cases when we talk about payment materials it is not linear the relationship between stress and strain is not linear it can take any shape different shapes can be observed such materials are considered to be non linear so materials are either described as linear materials or non linear materials accordingly either linear theory or non linear theory is selected for analysis of 
filaments containing these materials. Excuse me. Similarly, if you examine the behavior of the material after the load is released, for example, this is the deformation at time 0, that is when we have released the load. With time, some materials may recover the deformation instantaneously, whereas some of the materials may recover the deformation over some time period. This may be short time period or long time period, but some of these materials may not comple completely recover the total deformation. Part of the deformation is within practical time period is never recovered. This is permanent deformation, which is not recovered and the part of deformation that is recovered is elastic deformation accordingly the material is called uh, either as elastic material the material which exhibits complete recovery of deformation on release of load is considered to be elastic material. Materials which have partially or fully deformation which is not recovered are called as plastic materials. So, we use these ter two terms to describe the materials either elastic are plastic. Occasionally, we use a combination of these terms elastoplastic material that is displaying partly elastic recovery and then partly plastic deformation. The time depends of uh, certain materials can be seen here. Under constant stress, if the strain does not change with time, this is considered to be non viscous material. Whereas, for constant stress, if the strain goes on varying these two cases, they are considered to be viscous materials. In some cases, the relationship between strain and time is linear it can be nonlinear. So, we use various terms like linear, nonlinear, elastic, plastic, viscous, non viscous. So, the behavior of the material is normally described in terms of linear, nonlinear, elastic, plastic, and a combination of these terms are normally used. The material behavior normally depends upon as we have seen in the previous slides, the magnitude of load. Some of these materials have dependency on the magnitude of load at different load levels. They have different properties. They are also dependent on the time and frequency of loading, how frequently load is applied, for what duration the load is applied and also the nature of load. The Material is also dependent on the temperature to which the material is subjected to. We have just seen that uh, sort of a behavior in the previous slide. The material is also dependent in some materials. The behavior is dependent on moisture levels. We have considered that loading time is important as far as the characterization of payment material is 
concern. Some materials are subjected to short loading times in the payment and other materials for example, those materials which are at the bottom of the payment are subjected to much longer loading times. Accordingly, the behavior of these materials are going to be different. So, the loading time is a function of the speed of vehicle, size of the tire imprint or the load contact area and the load spreading capability of different payment layers and the position of the element or the layer that we are considering. For example, if you consider a layered system and if there is a load that is applied which is moving in this direction depending on the speed at which it is moving and if this is the length of the tire imprint that we have and this is the manner if you assume this is approximately the manner in which the stress is going to be distributed. So, at different depths the stress ball is going to have the dispersal area varying like that. At the top this is the area of stress dis uh, dispersal. So, the loading time starting from the point uh, at which significant amount of stress is considered to the time when stress becomes negligible. If you consider this to be loading time, this can be obtained by the length of tire, tire imprint dividing that by the speed at which the vehicle is travelling. Similarly, if you are trying to find out the loading time corresponding to this and this would be obtained by the length that we see here divided by the speed of the vehicle. So, if you consider points at different depths in the payment surface, obviously the magnitude of the load or stress is going to be different, it is going to be decreasing with the depth, but on the other hand the loading time is going to be increasing with the depth. So, at larger depth stress magnitude is going to be smaller but loading times are going to be larger. So, for conducting a test on different payment materials, this is done to obtain properties that are relevant for a given situation. For this, we have to consider the following aspects either for field or laboratory evaluation we should be able to simulate the magnitude, time and frequency and nature of load, the temperature to which the material is subjected to, moisture levels to which the material is going to be subjected to during its service life period and degree of compaction. As we mentioned earlier, in this lesson we are going to be focusing mostly on subgrade soils and embankment soils. Other types of materials we will be de dealing with in subsequent lectures. Soils are used in embankment portion, in subgrade. Once again subgrade is nothing but that portion which is right below the pavement and which is prepared to standard specifications and prepared to attain certain strength which is specified by the design and soils are also used in preparation of shoulders. Soil is used either in its natural form or in a processed or stabilized form. The most common properties that we determine are index properties or mechanical properties. Soils are classified using various systems. They are usually classified on the basis of particle size distribution and some index properties. In the Indian classification, soil is considered to be either coarse grain. For that, 
the soil should be having more than 50 percent of the particles larger than 75 micron size. The soil would be considered to be fine grain if more than 50 percent of the particles are smaller than 75 micron size. Typically, soil is designated in terms of gravel, sand, silt and clay depending on the particle size. 80 millimeter to 4.75 millimeter size is normally considered to be gravel. 4.75 millimeters to 75 micron is normally considered to be sand. Less than 75 micron size is considered to be either silt or clay. Subdivision could be in terms of 75 micron to 2 micron is silt, less than 2 micron is clay. However, normally this subdivision is done on the basis of the index properties which are liquid limit and plastic limit of the soil. The important index properties that we determine for soils are, these are called as Atterberg limits, liquid limit, plastic limit and shrinkage limit, liquid limit and plastic limit being more commonly used and more important. Liquid limit is the boundary between or it is the moisture content which serves as a boundary between two different phases of soil between liquid and then plastic. This is the minimum moisture content at which the soil is going to be in liquid content. Any more than this, it is going to be liquid, less than this, it is going to be in plastic condition. Similarly, plastic limit is the boundary between plastic and semi-solid condition. Moisture content more than plastic limit, the soil is going to be in plastic condition, less than this, it is going to be reaching a semi-solid condition. Liquid limit is defined as the minimum water content at which soil will flow when subjected to a very small shearing force. So, we are talking about a moisture content if which if exceeded is going to be leading to a flow condition. This is normally determined by cutting a groove in the soil paste placed in a cup. We are not going to discuss the details of the test procedure because these are standard topics that are normally covered in soil mechanics. The moisture content corresponding to the trial in which the groove closes after 25 drops of the cup is the liquid limit. After cutting the groove in the soil placed in the cup, the cup is made to be lifted up and made to drop. This is done for 25 times. There is a particular moisture content corresponding to which the groove is going to be closed after 25 drops of the cup. That is defined as the liquid limit. Obviously, we have to make number of trials with different moisture contents and then obtain the liquid limit. Plastic limit is the minimum water content at which the soil remains in a plastic state. This is the stage at which physically this is how we can identify this. This is the stage at which the soil can be rolled into a thread of 3 millimeter dia without crumbling. We start making roll of a thread of 3 millimeter dia by rolling it and as we allow the moisture content to go on reducing the condition at which the thread 3 millimeter dia thread starts crumbling that represents the plastic limit condition. So, the moisture content of that specimen of soil is determined and that is identified as the plastic limit. An important parameter which is known as plasticity index is obtained by subtracting plastic limit from liquid limit. Plasticity index represents the range of water content in which the soil remains in a plastic state. Shrinkage limit is the maximum water content at which further reduction in water content does not cause reduction in the volume of the soil. As I indicated earlier, as I mentioned earlier, there are various classification systems that are followed for classifying soil. Textural classification, unified classification, 
Bureau of Indian Standards Classification and Highway Research Board and uh, American Association of State Highway Transport Officials Classification. Various systems are available. Starting with textual classification, though a not very commonly used classification, but it is a very simple system, which is based on the gradation or particle size distribution of the soil. As you can see in this triangular chart, if we know the percentage of sand in the soil and percentage of clay, that means if you consider the soil to be a system con consisting of sand, clay and silt, the bottom axis is silt. So, if you know any one, uh, any two of them, obviously we know about the third value. For example, if we have 40 percent clay, sorry 40 percent sand and 60 percent 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent clay, this is intersection point and this is zone within which it is going to lie. So, this is designated as clay. Similarly, if you find a point designated in this zone, depending on the percentage of sand, percentage of clay and percentage of silt, then this would be called as silty loam. In this zone, it is clay loam, loam, sand, sandy loam. This is a very convenient method, but not very commonly used nowadays. Coming to the unified classification, this is based on both the particle size distribution that is gradation and also the index properties that is Atterberg limits. In this case also coarse grain particles are considered to be those having more than 50 percent retained on 75 micron sieve. We use different notations for identifying different types of soils, G for gravel, S for sand, M for silt, C for clay and if uh, we are dealing with sands or gravels which are not clean, that means those sands and gravel that contain clay or silt, then they are designated in terms of clay and silty, but if you are dealing with clean sands or clean gravels, then they are further <coughs> designated in terms of their gradation, whether they are poorly graded or well graded. For example, G w is the notation that we use for well graded clean gravels, S p is the notation that we use for poorly graded sand and if the sand contains clay, then it is designated as clay sand. Fine grain soils are those soils having more than 50 percent passing 75 micron C. Here again we use notations such as M for silt, C for clay, if it is an organic soil O and depending on the plasticity of the material, low plasticity materials with L and high plasticity materials with H. So, ML means sills of low compressibility and low plasticity, GC clay gravels, CH high compressibility clay. The Indian system that is Bureau of Indian Standards soil classification is very similar to unified classification system. The highway research board or the astro classification is also based on aggregate uh, particle size distribution and the Atterberg limits. There is a parameter called group index G i is used to designate or to uh, carry out the classification of soils. We have different groups of soils in terms of A 1 ranging from A 1 to A 7 C. Each one of these groups 
we have subgroups for, for example, A 1 has got subgroups ranging from A 1 A to A 1 B. A 1 group of soils are having J values of 0, their core granite materials have low plasticity and are usually considered to be excellent for subgrade construction. Whereas, A 7 groups are fine, fine grain soil with high plasticity and have J values as high as 20 and considered to be poor for subgrade construction. Various soil strength parameters are determined and for doing that, we need to understand the factors that influence soil strength. Obviously, the soil strength is going to be varying depending on the type of soil that we use. Granular soils usually have better strength compared to fine grained soils and the strength is also a function of particle size distribution, which influences the coefficient of internal friction and cohesion that is mobilized. The strength is also a function of degree of compaction, which greatly influences the strength. Strength again is influenced by the moisture content, which in turn affects the density that is attainable cohesion and internal friction that can be mobilized. In some materials, especially granular materials, confinement plays a significant role. Granular materials are usually are stronger when they are confined, but without confinement, they are not so strong. The permeability characteristics of the materials affect the effectiveness of drainage, which in turn affects the shear strength of the material. The soil strength parameters or different types of parameters are evaluated. For determining soil strength, various types of tests are conducted. These are shear, shear tests, normally conducted on laboratory samples. All these tests can be conducted both in laboratory and also in field, but shear strength tests are normally conducted in laboratory on laboratory specimens. Under specified conditions of loading, compaction and drainage, bearing tests are usually conducted in field, again usually conducted under specified loading conditions using specified loading area and specified rate of loading. Whereas, penetration tests also are conducted either in laboratory or in field, but more commonly on laboratory specimens. These tests give a measure of resistance of soil sample prepared to standard conditions to the penetration of a standard plunger or in some cases to the penetration of a standard needle. One of the tests that is conducted for evaluating shear strength is the shear box test, in which this is the specimen that is prepared, soil specimen prepared to standard specification, standard compaction using standard moisture content. As you can see, this box is in two halves. and there is normal load that is applied. There is also a provision for drainage of water if required. So, what is done is that there is normal load that is applied and the bottom half, one of these two halves is made to be slided by the application of a horizontal force. So, what is determined here is by varying the normal stress, different tests are conducted and the horizontal force that is required to cause sliding or failure of the specimen is recorded. 
So, for different normal stresses, the corresponding shear stress is noted and the relationship between the normal stress and the shear stress that is applied. Since we know the horizontal force, we know the cross sectional area of the specimen here, we can calculate the shear stress. So, for different normal stresses that are applied here, what is the corresponding shear stress that can be obtained? So, from this relationship, this gives the angle of internal friction phi, this ordinate gives the value of cohesion that is C. Shear box test is normally conducted on remolded samples or undisturbed samples. It is conducted either in drained condition or undrained condition. Another test that is normally conducted is a triaxial shear test. In this, the specimen is subjected to three normal compressive stresses. Normally, the specimen which is cylindrical in shape is prepared to standard compaction using specified moisture content. This can be conducted in drained or undrained condition. This is normally put in a shell and then this is the confining pressure that is applied all around the specimen confining stress or confining pressure and this is the normal pressure that is applied. Here again a number of tests are conducted for a given confining pressure, the stress, the normal stress, vertical stress that is required to cause failure of the specimen is noted and various combinations of confining pressure and vertical pressure are noted and these are plotted as more circles. Each one of these circles represents one test condition, one set of test conditions. For example, this circle has been plotted by knowing the confining pressure that is applied and the vertical pressure that is applied corresponding to failure. So, as we have different circles for different confining pressures and the corresponding sigma 1, if a tangent can be drawn for all these circles, this angle gives us the phi and this value gives us C. The triaxial test can be conducted either in static mode or repeated loading condition. Normally for payments, since we have cyclic loads, repeated loads, this test it is normally recommended that we have to conduct uh, triaxial test under repeated loading conditions, but if we are trying to design embankments, foundations and other uh, such structures or facilities, it is sufficient that we conduct only static triaxial test. The triaxial test results are norm that is static triaxial test results are normally used for stability analysis of embankments, settlement analysis and design of retaining walls. There is another very important test that is conducted for obtaining a parameter known as modulus of subgrade reaction, which is used in the design of concrete pavements. In this what we do is, this is the subgrade whose modulus of subgrade reaction is to be determined. A system of plates are placed on the subgrade, we use number of plates so to stiffen the loading plate. These bottommost loading plate normally having a diameter of 760 millimeters and load is applied through this reaction frame.
and this jack so the slope is gradually increased and the deflection of the subgrade at the center of the plate is recorded so with increasing load what is the corresponding settlement or displacement are recorded and plotted like this this is the bearing pressure that is applied which which was gradually increased and this is the corresponding settlement using a 750 mm uh, 760 mm plate the bearing pressure corresponding to a specified deflection is noted and the pressure divided by the corresponding settlement or deflection is known as modulus of subgrade reaction this normally is determined for a, a standard plate size if for some reason we are not able to use this bigger size plate for this we norm, naturally we will have to apply more load if we are having to use a smaller plate then the k value obtained using a smaller plate will have to be adjusted to corresponding to this larger size plate similarly normally the k value is determined corresponding to worst moisture uh, uh, condition if we are not determining worst moisture condition k value then whatever is the moisture content at the time of conducting the test that moisture content has to be noted down and the k value will have to be adjusted to correspond to the worst moisture condition the most important test that is normally conducted on subgrade soils is the california bearing ratio test in which a standard plunger is made to which is of 50 mm dia is made to penetrate into a soil specimen of 152 mm dia 125 mm height prepared to standard density moisture content this test can be conducted either in unsoaked condition or soaked condition the plunger is made to penetrate at a standard rate of 1.25 mm per minute so with penetration what is the resistance offered by the soil to the penetration of the plunger is recorded and plotted like this so here you have the penetration and the corresponding load applied cbr is the ratio of load carried by the specimen to the load carried by a standard crushed stone expressed as percentage if you are considering a penetration of 2.5 mm 6.895 mpa is the pressure that is considered instead of load that is a corresponding bearing pressure that is applied if a 5 mm penetration is considered 10.343 mm uh, mpa pressure is considered normally 2.5 mm cbr value is considered that is the ratio obtained corresponding to 2.5 mm penetration is used for design it is normally more than 5 mm cbr value but if 5 mm value happens to be more than 2.5 mm value the test will have to repeat it and then if you still get a value for 5 mm greater than 2.5 mm then that is the value that has to be used cbr california bearing ratio is the most commonly used parameter for pavement design however the drawbacks are this is purely empirical this does not truly represent any fundamental characteristics of metal behavior it does not explore explain how a metal behaves what exactly happens when load is applied to the subgrade soil so this test normally is not in a position to explain the fundamental nature soil compaction is another important phenomenon that we have to understand soils with greater degree of compaction naturally have greater strength 
Compaction reduces the possibility of settlement in an embankment. It is normally desirable to compact the soils to the maximum degree that is possible. The degree of compaction attainable varies with soil. Also, the degree of compaction is very importantly a function of moisture content and the compactive effort used. For a given soil and for a given compaction effort, there is a moisture content which gives us maximum density. This is called as optimum moisture content. To determine the mo optimum moisture content and also to find out what is the density that can be obtained corresponding to optimum moisture content, Proctor compaction test is normally conducted, which gives us the density of soil as it varies with variation in moisture content and thereby giving us optimum moisture content and also the maximum dry density. Typically, moisture content is varied and the corresponding dry density is obtained and from this plot, we can obtain the optimum moisture content and the maximum dry density. We can carry out either a standard Proctor compaction test or a modified Proctor compaction test by adopting different compact, compact efforts by varying the weight, by varying the size of the specimen, drop and number of blows. So, there are two types of compaction effort that we normally consider standard or modified. The selection of compaction effort and moisture content for test should be represented of the field conditions, either new or existing payments. To summarize, in this lesson, we have discussed about various materials that can be used in payment construction. We also understood the need to examine the behavior of some of these materials, which are dependent on loading conditions, dependent on loading time and temperature. We also understood that it is necessary that appropriate material properties are selected to correspond to the design method selected and it is also essential that various soil related parameters are to be considered which have some correlation to payment performance. Let us take up some questions for this lesson. What is an elastic material? Question 2. What is a linear material? Question 3. Estimate the loading time on an element very close to the pavement surface. If a wheel moves at a at 60 kilometers per hour speed, wheel load is 20 kilo Newton, tire pressure is 0.56 MPa. Fourth question. What is the function of the surcharge disc in a CBR test? Fifth question. What is the optimum moisture content? Let us consider the answers for the questions that were asked in the previous lesson that was lesson 4.3. The first question was explain the concept of fixed traffic, fixed vehicle and various variable vehicle and traffic approaches. Fixed traffic, this is normally applicable for airport payments in which we are concerned about very heavy vehicles and then the heavy vehicle is converted into an equivalent single wheel load. We are not really so much concerned about the number of repetitions. In fixed traffic, we are concerned about very heavy load, not about number of repetitions. In fixed vehicle, we are concerned about the number of repetitions and we talk about a standard load. Normally, we talk about a standard axle, usually 80 kilo Newton standard axle is considered. Whereas, in very variable vehicle and traffic approaches, what we do is, we, we are concerned about the loads, we are also concerned about the number of repetitions of each load. This is when we are trying to calculate the cumulative damage caused by each one of those repetitions. Normally, when we try to calculate cumulative damage caused by fatigue phenomenon or permanent deformation caused because of repeated application of loads. So, that is when we consider variable vehicle, variable traffic approaches. 100 repetitions of 140 axle loads is equivalent to how many standard axle load repetitions? This is simple. As we have seen earlier, 140 divide by 80 to the power 4 into 100. So, 
we can obtain the number of repetitions of 140 kilo Newton that are equivalent to 100 kilo Newton axles. Next question is to estimate the design traffic using the following data. This is a two lane road. We have average design traffic of 4000, which is a two way traffic. Vehicle damage factor is 5, design life is 15 years, rate of growth is commercial traffic. Using the formula that we have given earlier, cumulative standard axles can be given as 365 into A, 4000 into 1 plus 0 0.07 to the power 15 is the design life period divided by rate of growth into 0.75 we are considered to take into account the lateral distribution factor into phi that is equivalent to 215.8 million standard axles. Thank you.